Uh, just to go over some quick housekeeping items here, um, please know that uh, you will all be on mute, uh, and you can ask any questions that you need to using the questions panel on the side. Uh, we're going to keep the introduction short uh, since uh, we have run a few minutes in here already. Uh, but Keith is a visionary in the testing space, and he has over 20 years of testing experience. I'm sure many of you uh, know his name already, but he is the executive vice president of the Association for Software Testing, uh, and he's very involved in designing and creating the Perscalis program. Uh, and he was actually at the White House uh, recently, so that's uh, very exciting for him. Uh, and he's got a, a blog, uh, qualityremarks.com, that you guys can check out. And uh, so I'll let him take it away. Uh, sorry about that and about the uh, confusion with the audio here, um, but we'll get going. And uh, Keith, you can take it away. Great. Thanks, Kevin. So uh, just to kind of restate my standard disclaimers um, before I start talking about anything in the uh, testing business, uh, is that these are my opinions. <laughs> And they are formed out of, uh, you know, obviously I'm fairly biased. I, uh, I identify very closely with the context-driven testing school and uh, all the, the kind of folks that are in that. Um, and, and these are ideas and things that I've observed throughout the year moving from the uh, buy side, uh, being uh, leaving Barclays uh, in the early uh, part of the year to join Doran Jones as a, on the supply side. So having gotten out in the world a little bit more as, as the post to being a buyer and, and, and more of a supplier now, uh, attending conferences and talking to folks. But it's important to know that these are, you know, my, my opinions, I'm, I'm, if you know me at all, I'm fairly biased. And that, and that uh, my context, which I think is important, is what, what I refer to as enterprise IT. Uh, so th those are uh, technology companies that, um, build uh, non-traditional technology companies that build technology. So these are people like uh, banks, insurance companies that also build software themselves. So um, as well, happy to take questions on this and give my opinions. I'm not an expert on everything. Um, and uh, the sources that I'm using to kind of uh, peer into my crystal ball are some, you know, I'm a pretty avid reader of Fast Company, Forbes, uh, Gartner. Um, uh, I've flicked through some of the larger software testing reports, like the World Quality Report, and also my observations from being pretty heavy on the conference circuit. Uh, and as well, uh, a lot of the work we've done with clients this year. We've talked to you know dozens of prospects as well as, as quite a few clients uh, with the work we're doing at Doran Jones. And so some of this is my insight from there. So. With that, uh, I'll start on my view on the state of our testing union this year. So I think if you can judge anything, and Kevin, please jump in if you've got questions or comments as well. Absolutely. I'll be sure to. Great. So to start off, I think we've seen the testing business mature quite a bit. Maybe over the last five years, it's still a long way to go, um, but if you can use any kind of barometer for how things have changed um, if, if people vote with their feet and with their wallets. So if you look at the spend that people are contributing to their testing efforts, it's almost doubled um, in the last five years from what people are reporting as their uh, budget allocated to testing specific activities. Now, drilling down into those figures is difficult because what is defined as a testing activity, my guess and how I've done this um, as, as running test organizations is almost a purely headcount figure. Um, but it's really, and it has grown quite a bit over the last five years and is going to continue to grow over the next couple years as well. I think the, the importance of testing and particularly around what, what a lot of people refer to as app quality, um, has increased. And part of that's due not to, I think, any great success stories that we have, but more down to some of the more high profile or failures that we've had. And if you look at, you know, one of the hallmarks of, of 2013, which was the healthcare.gov kind of, you know, roll, fiasco of a rollout, um, as well as uh, Knight Capital and some of the other kind of high-profile, big market-moving events, 
um, despite those, uh, we don't really seem to be doing a better job, um, maybe as an industry or, or as a, a market. Um, we've had, I think 2014 has been, uh, its hallmark has been uh, around data security and major security breaches. You know, we're seeing right now that the, the, the Sony hack, and they're still really trying to figure out what, uh, what happened there. Uh, we've had multiple major bank issues around data security, uh, high-profile high retail failures around data security, um, you know, terabytes of data being stolen, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of uh, customer records being, <laughs> being stolen, um, that despite that, um, we still really haven't seen any major improvements in that space. Um, you know, if you look at the last, the, the, the Apple uh, release for iOS 8, which was basically the buggiest release of their operating system that they've ever done, um, and that was this year. So I, I, I think that there's lots of talk around uh, software testing. I think people are using like application quality, but not really closing the loop with how that relates to software testing. Um, as far as the major players in the market, you know, it's still very, very dominated by, you know, I call these 800-pound gorilla. These are major, major large systems integrators, which are huge vendors that have large portions of their team offshore. They are the ones who are, you know, do a lot of marketing in our space and create a lot of the market with the services that they offer. So you're still seeing a lot of talk and companies moving towards this idea of a testing center of excellence. Um, outsourcing is increasing in our, in our business, um, although offshoring seems to be hit a plateau a little bit. And um, there's, there's a lot of talk, particularly in the U.S., around uh, onshoring and looking at rural shoring, I think that's still a, a, a minor uh, contributor to that. But I think uh, there's lots of things that have created that scenario, particularly around companies' uh, attempts to move towards agile, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But those large shops are still primarily made up of you know high volume, low margin uh, test factories. That that's still their 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 kind of core business, and a lot of this is down to not so much in Europe, but India is still a very big player in this. Although if you look at the Indian conference circuit, you're starting to see people talk about how do we change the value perception of these TCOEs um, and that they don't seem to be delivering uh, responsive, um, non-deterministic uh, test strategies and approaches. And a lot of that's down to the very highly scripted uh, models that they, that they employ. And they're difficult to integrate into an agile environment. Um, and if you look at it, and reading uh, one of the major industry uh, agile reports just recently, um, they interviewed, I think, 900 or to 1,000 software testers. Um, and particularly in the offshore market, it, a, a, amazing stat that came out of that was uh, almost 50% of testers spend more than one day a week of their work week on non-testing related activities. So you're basically losing more than a day a week in productivity or actually getting testing done by using one of those models. Um, the other, the other uh, aspect to this, and I, I'm a big critic of our business uh, as, as I think we can do a much better job. And some of the, uh, the things that I've seen come out this year uh, in the kind of, wait, what, what, was, what was that uh, 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 bucket where we are still rife with people and, and the obsession in our business with numbers. Um, the, the, I like to call them defect predictinators. They, the, we are still rife with, with that type of stuff. And I, I've seen at least on three different occasions this year, large vendors come out 
with new metric scorecards around SLAs and KPIs that are basically rehashes of things that were essentially decredited, uh, discredited years ago. Um, I've seen a report from a vendor this year um, that tried to sell to me um, agile KPIs. Uh, I'm not even really sure what that means. Um, uh, you know, I think another hallmark this year was the whole kerfuffle around ISO 29119. Um, and those are things where you, when you are in the middle of testing, and I think that's one of the, the issues with our business, is that when you're getting testing done, and then you, you stick your head up and see what's going on in the market a little bit, you have those moments of what, what, what are these people actually talking about? Um, I saw a report uh, or a case study that was published around a new test estimation process that moved something towards work units um, that literally took almost 12, the case study said it took 12 months to implement. Um, and there, after those 12 months of implementing it with a team, this is literally just a test estimation model. They're trying to cut costs by 40 percent um, and uh, attain a 30 percent testing efficiency gain. I think some of that stuff where you see these kind of pop up in the market a little bit, you, when I review those, I have the standard, you know, they don't pass the kind of uh, sniff test of, you know, what are they act, what are the problem they're actually trying to solve? And if you look at employing a team for 12 months to implement a test estimation model to cut costs, a, a good place that would have started to cut would probably not doing that project, if you ask, ask my opinion. Um, and lastly, you know, I think there's been a few things published this year around what Agile is and, I, and, and, and how testing interacts with that. I still don't think, and I, and I think uh, James Bach and Michael Bolton have done a lot of work in this space recently, and there's a great uh, presentation that they gave about that, um, testing in Agile context. What I've seen from talking to clients this year is that that basically means, um, you know, ironically called ad hoc testing or some exploratory testing in an unstructured way um, combined with some level of automated unit testing, which they're calling continuous integration, which is kind of misnamed as well. Although, again, I think rather ironically, one of the large agile testing reports that were put out this year said that company are self-identifying self themselves as about half of them in this report were using Agile methods, but also that half of the people who were using Agile methods were finding no defects earlier in the process, which to me lends a lot of questions around what are we actually calling a defect and what, what, what if you're using an Agile methodology, what does that actually mean? And why aren't you finding things earlier? And, and one of the questions we're getting a lot from clients this year is as a result of their fairly large um, investment over the last decade in massive functional regression tests and, and a, loads and loads and loads of automated machine checking, um, how does that adapt to an agile environment? And I think what we're seeing in the review we just recently did with the company um, is that you know some you know my view on this is sometimes you know the, the 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 best fisherman knows when it's time to cut the line, and those investments um, around very shallow brittle automation um, might it might be best to stop those and reallocate those sources other other places. So I think to kind of summarize, you know we've seen. Uh, a few things changed in terms of the, the amount of spend that's coming out this year, but in regards to how the market looks, I think things are slowly kind of at the tectonic plate speed, um, starting to shift towards more skill-based testing and, and rethinking some of the kind of constructs and paradigms that, that are uh, this this business has been viewed at over the over the course of the years. I think actually 2015 is going to be a really interesting year for um, new things to come up. Well, Do you have any questions on that? 
Yeah, Keith, I think that's a great intro, you know, and uh, we re I really agree with you as well. You know, there's a lot of things that are, are beginning to change, obviously, and we see a lot of change uh, underfoot and underway right now. Um, I think specifically, you know, the points that, that you brought up, uh, especially about Agile and, and the kind of onshoring and offshoring, to me, uh, I think those are, you know, big impacts, right, about productivity and, and productivity gains and, and trying to manage an Agile process, right, if you're going offshore uh, and trying to manage all of that, it can, it can be a lot and you, you get into a lot of uh, doing a lot more management than a lot more testing. And I think, you know, uh, we, we really appreciate at QA Symphony uh, your, your focus on kind of trying to have testers do, get around to testing, right, and not around so much to managing testing. So I uh, definitely appreciate those insights. And uh, I think that's a good good segue to try to get into uh, sort of talking about what you what you see coming in 2015 here and uh, moving on sort of into your, your technology trends section of the, uh, of the presentation. One point I wanted to pick up there though, Kevin, that you said yeah. is that I think you see organizations kind of ping pong back and forth between these things. So they, they've made a big investment in a commoditization approach to testing yeah. and offshore to try and control costs as much as possible. Now, when your business demands change and you need more continuous releases, you need more continuous deployment, um, people start looking at productivity. And yep. when you start trying to define what that actually means, they bump up into the same questions. Those are hard questions, how to define testing productivity. And when you're trying to wring out whatever uh, productivity that out of a TCOE that you've made that decision based almost entirely on cost, um, you have to literally rethink that whole model. And I think that's why right now you're starting to see some of these big vendors um, that, that market these TCOEs trying to reframe the decisions around why you use one because I think the value proposition is fundamentally kind of caving in on itself. Yep. Yeah, I know. I think in the testing center of excellence, we definitely see that's kind of a, you know, it's a very uh, divisive issue to some to some folks. You know, some some companies love them and they love working with them. And then other companies, they find that, you know, it's kind of limiting in terms of, uh, you know, limiting the things that they can do as well. So we definitely see the testing center of excellence, um, you know, as kind of one of those things to keep an eye on it, uh, as we move forward. Obviously, a buzzword and everyone um, knows what they are and, and has heard of the name before, right? But what's the impact to that on, on the testers and, and test managers as well? So I think that's a great point. Fair, fair, fair point. Um, so, you know, in terms of trends that I see, and I, you know, I think you can very easily devolve into uh, buzzword bingo. So um, uh, as, as this is our, our first one, I'm, I'm going to play a little bit of buzzword bingo myself and have done some research on some of these things. I think, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, the, the school of thought that I align myself to, I think your, your approach adapts to the environment um, and, and, and the context. So some of these things, I think, as an industry, we're still getting our head around on how to do testing properly um, and, and, and the approach for that that I, I think is, is still based. So I'm going to go through a few things that I think are, um, you know, trends uh, in technology in general and what I think their impact is. So there's been lots of talk around the Internet of Things and computing everywhere. Um, you know, a lot of this has to do with uh, smartphones and the amount of computing power that we carry around in our pockets every day. I think you're also starting to see um, the beginning of, of wearables and, and embedded tech, which is a slightly different problem to solve in, in terms of application uh, ability and, and data. Um, I think both those things their impact on testing as, as we see the, the kind of growth in this, which I think if you look at the, the relatively flattish to up uh, mobile market um, over the course of, of 2015, I think the impact of testing is going to be relatively the same as it is now, but as more uh, consumers want non-traditional digital and mobile um, uh, applications in a digital or mobile environment, you'll see a lot of the banks um, having to increase security, 
I know talking to a few uh, cons uh, uh, security consultants over the last couple weeks uh, that that's not really where it should be and that um, if, if the banks aren't doing a great job uh, in terms of that. So I think what you'll see is that as this kind of touches the non uh, pure play mobile and digital market, um, you'll, you'll see it will contribute to the increase in spend uh, for testing. So I think that will create additional opportunities for testers to get into um, the, the business. Uh, I think the complexity around configurations and device testing is, gonna, is only going to get larger, um, particularly if you're talking about regionalization. I think you've seen some um, players in the market start to uh, increase their footprint uh, in terms of the types of testing that they offer um, in terms of integration testing, in particular on performance testing, um, or as some people term non-functional testing. Uh, that, that's going to have a big impact in that space over the course of the next year and I think in, in the future as well. Um, in, in regards to kind of context rich systems, so these are you know, kind of defined as systems that respond to their environment, um, that, that they're alert uh, and change context. So this would be similar to things like intelligent security systems that are I think uh, physical as well as digital. And we haven't had the, despite everything that's gone on this year in terms of security, we really haven't had the kind of earth-shattering uh, event that is going to bring that to the forefront um, that I've been anticipating, quite frankly. Um, but I, I think that's, that's going to, uh, the impact for software testing is that the traditional approach of a very kind of deterministic um, test plan or strategy, it, it kind of throws that out of the window. So if you're working on systems that respond to their surroundings, you need to have um, lighter weight plans and lighter weight strategies that are reactive. And, and I think you'll start to hear some of the buzzword uh, bingo around uh, heuristics thrown out even more than they are now, uh, and uh, heuristic-based test strategies are going to become a much larger uh, part of our vernacular. Hey Keith, um, I've got I've got a quick question for you. Sure. Yeah. So, how do you think, in terms of context-rich systems, and you know what you're saying that they're responsive systems, right? First of all, um, how do you think that that impacts, you know, the ability or the need uh, for automation versus manual testing, uh, you know, going forward? And do you see any impact there? And then secondly, kind of talking about uh, your point about not having that earth-shattering event, my other question was, um, do you think those events are, are the type of events that testers need to be uh, communicating to, to their managers and to their executive leadership to try to get more awareness around the importance of testing and, and what quality can do for an organization? Sure. So to, to, to take those in turn, I think you're already starting to see the, the, the impact on, on automation already. And I think some of that has to do with the way systems are deployed and the, the need for continuous deployment and continuous integration, which has an impact on your automation strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you can't automate a lot of that. And, and you want to push some of that lower lower down into the stack in terms of what what you automate, um, which has been the trend, I think, for the last five, ten years anyway. Um, but some of those things can't be automated. And I think I'm going to – I talk a little bit later about, um, you know, emotional testing. And some of those things that, you know, it's going to require more expert user testing. Um, and, and I think that has to do with quickly adapting, which, which frankly automation can't do, which is very different than what some people interpret as behavior-driven development. So um, you'll be able to, you, you, the, the ability to quickly write and come up with great test ideas and execute on those strategies is going to become a very valuable skill um, in, in, in this market. Right? Okay, great. So for, for uh, move, moving, moving on through here, um, in, in terms of big data, you know, which I think we still talk about big data, I think some of the issues with this, and, you know, it's a very buzzwordy thing, is that, you know, if you look at the velocity and the amount of data that's coming in, and as well the variety of data, 
um, just the sources and the different types of data, it's, it's still overwhelming. And I think some of these folks have started to crack that a little bit um, with, the, with, with things like Hadoop. Um, you know, I think you know, Yahoo and Facebook, and I think um, Microsoft actually moved its Azure onto Hadoop, are starting to get a handle on that in terms of just the technical aspects of how do we process all this stuff. Um, you know, you're going, I think what you'll see is analytics are, part of it is going to be embedded within applications um, to tr just to deal with the overwhelming volumes of data. And I think a, a great place for testing to have an impact there is to help organizations answer the question why. And I've seen this in pre and post trade analytics and financial services is that a lot of times technologists can get hung up on the question of can we do this as opposed to should we do this. And you can go down a lot of rabbit holes that way. And I think having a, a testing mind frame um, is, is a great place to start uh, for that. And I think it's a, a, a way that testers can really add a lot of value when it comes to you know, the idea of big data is helping people reframe the questions of why are we actually getting this data or what are we using it for. Um, yeah, in, in regards to smart machines, and this is actually, you know, having small kids myself, you know, we're crazy about robots in my house. So, um, you know, robotics, uh, you know, intelligent cars, non-deterministic systems, you know, these are uh, things that have smart applications that are embedding analytics and adapt to their context and learn um, what your uh, preferences are and, and adapt to their environment. Um, I, I'm not really sure exactly. I like I, I see this, you know, as something like you know the the amount of intelligence that's built into cars these days. I think actually this is a, we talked about earlier, Kevin. This is a point you made around automation. I actually think this is going to have an impact on automation, and that um, that was my, my my point here is that okay people are going to have to fundamentally rethink how this stuff has been built um, to date because a lot of your traditional sources for test automation, um, you know, is heavily reliant on just pure checking. Um, and I think that's a, there's an open market there for new ideas. Yep. Yeah, for sure. I, I think, you know, it's going to become very complex, right, that it's almost you have to do the balancing act of is it going to take you more time to build out ways of automating testing than it would to just perform the testing itself, right, and, and all about reusability and that balance. So I think it's going to be very... Uh, complex for, for people to try to figure out what that balance is going to be going forward. I, I, I agree, and I think that's kind of been the holy grail of test automation anyway, is how do we, you know, this, this idea of return on investment for automation, and I think, you know, most of the models, and I've been a, high, a very big critic of this when I was running, you know, testing teams for organizations, a lot of the models that are used for ROI and test automation are just, you know, nonsense as far as I'm concerned. And, don't stand up to even the slightest amount of scrutiny. So if you and the tools are expensive and take a lot of time to maintain. So how do we justify the spend on that if it can't adapt? So I think again, pushing automation lower into the stack as much as possible it seems to be the the, the current thinking. Um, yep. uh, in in terms of cloud, you know, I, I think as well this is going to have an impact on uh, performance testing. You know, particularly where you start to see, you know, where the cloud and mobile, particularly for, for as companies fight over bandwidth and storage, um, for analytics that get embedded in devices, um, you know, that will, the, the impact of testing, I think, will be an increased focus on performance. You know, I, I don't think we've, the, the device and app market has not overtaken the storage and bandwidth uh, um, delivery capability yet. Although I think particularly the way things are managed kind of publicly and privately, if you saw a big move uh, from organizations into a more public cloud uh, approach, particularly in kind of like I said, my context is the enterprise IT, um, I think you'd start to see more pressure on that. Um, so 
Yeah, so Keith, did you have, a, you know, in your experience coming from Barclays, obviously a highly regulated space in a, in a large company, um, what, what's your experience just in general? Do you think people are opening up more to the security issues around the cloud and, and moving, you know, especially that big data and, and some of that customer data into the cloud? Or do you think that that's still a hesitation at this point? And do you see that changing in 2015 at all? Well, I, I, th I think you're going to see bits and pieces change. I don't think next year you're going to see a big move from somebody. I know from working at multiple banks, um, you know, and without naming names, that there's been attempts at kind of private clouds, um, you know, moving an investment bank into, like, Amazon, you know, cloud. It, it just, I, I don't, I, I see one, there's too much of a big investment in data centers and, and the kind of, you know, walls that need to be built around data, particularly for large multinationals. So it was always something that we struggled with where, you know, how do we actually get this done? I, I think the, the, the cost, um, you know, we've had a few visionary CIOs who thought that they were going to take cost out through moving everything in the cloud and investment bank. It's just the, the practicalities of it and the regulatory issues I don't think are there yet. Okay. Um, so I don't, I, you know, it's, I think it's something that's, been talked a lot about, um, but there's there's a lot of issues, particularly in investment banking. Um, but you know, I had an interesting talk with a, a, a CIO of a hedge fund the other day, and um, he's got a friend who has just started as a CIO of a, a a new fund that's brand new. And we were talking about um, you know if you were starting from scratch, if you were building you know an investment bank or a fund from scratch, technology wise. Um, what would you do, mm -hmm. and how would you do it? And I think that's a big part of the issue. And so it's there's no physical space. I mean, they literally are pure cloud. They've got very little in terms of machines, um, and, and and their costs are just like hardly anything. And and everything that they wanted to, and what they're finding is that everything they've always wanted to do and transition a lot of these banks towards, they're able to do from the ground up. And that, that's always been a big issue particularly in investment banking, is that there's such a large investment in the way things are currently done, you, you know, changing that, change costs a lot of money, you know, and a lot of time and energy. Um, and so if you could start over, would you do it the same way? And I think what you might see is new companies um, being able to leapfrog into spaces that they ordinarily might not do because they're much more nimble due to their, IT infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, I think that's some great, great insight uh, there. I think, uh, you know, at, at this point, Keith, we should definitely move, uh, drum roll, starting, we should move on to your uh, your predictions for 2015 here um, and, and uh, make sure we leave some time for some questions. So let, if that's all right with you, let's move on to it. I'll move along. <laughs> all right. So these are my predictions for next year. Um, I, 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 you're struggling with this a little bit because you know, you always have to be careful what you say because it will come back and you can be held to it. So these are my, uh, you know, these are my predictions uh, for, for, for next year. We'll see uh, when we do this again um, in 2015 how, how close I was to being right. <laughs> <laughs> and I challenge everybody else to make predictions as well and see how, it's, uh, how close they come to it. So, um, so in, in terms, I, I, personally believe in it and I you know I've, I've struggled with this fought against it um, and um, have been a very public voice in terms of the 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 harm and dangers of certifications but I I really think that market is drying up so I'm talking about the kind of you know ISTQB TMMI um, kind of like let's assess our quality process I, I see that market as plateauing over the course of next year I think you know and to me, the kind of jump the shark moment um, for this stuff was seeing people trying to agile uh, 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 certify agile testers, you know, which to me is really more about skills and, and competencies. You know, um, if you look at the uh, the latest European testing report that I read, um, yeah, I think it was fifty percent of the testers who responded in Europe have a credential, and absolutely none of them reported that it mattered. Mm. <laughs> so I think. Uh, you know, very public data around that um, is 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 important. So my prediction on this for for 2015 is that um, there's going to be a a 
an, an opening for creating a new way of, of demonstrating skill, kind of like a GitHub uh, for testing. Um, and, and there's testing bits on GitHub, but it's really uh, related to kind of non or uh, lower level unit level tests and things like that. And if you look at uh, you, you know, things like LinkedIn, which are really becoming unfit for purpose for um, um, resumes and basically demonstrating your ability, um, I, I think that there's going to be a rise for something like that uh, next year. You know, we've been working closely with a couple startups on this, um, one of them called Akimbo um, and one of them called Untapped, which are much better at being able to for employers to actually give problems to empo potential employees to solve better and new ways to demonstrate your skills. So my prediction on this next year is that there's going to be some rise of some kind of GitHub for testing or some new marketplace for demonstrating testing skills. Um, uh, that's my that's my prediction. First one. So the second second point here is uh, you know and, and again being a uh, in the school of context driven testing. I, I think you and, and you're seeing some fantastic work being done out of kind of like my second favorite uh, consultancy on the planet, um, Assurity, which is out in New, uh, New Zealand. Um, you're seeing um, the, the the rise of the, the the particularly in some of the buzzword bingo, but the vernacular of the the the, the context-driven testing community being used um, in a larger way in the market. I think the TCOE is on its way out, um, and I have not been calling for that uh, for the last five years. I, as, I think the value proposition, the, the, the growth of co-managed services, is that this idea of a centralized center of excellence is, is on its way out. You're seeing things, and I'm very excited about it, but the AST skills book um, is a way of, again, demonstrating skill, and that's, I think, going to become a more important so one of my predictions for, for my second prediction for next year is that you're going to see an increase, um, and I don't know how I can measure that, um, being a skeptic of measurement anyway, but um, in CDT uh, consultancies, marketing and training. I think you know, we've seen already at Doran Jones competing with consultancies who somehow magically um, offer CDT training um, when they're competing against us for bids. So that's my, my second prediction is that you're going to see an increase in the amount of context-driven testing talk in the market next year. Yeah, and Keith, do you find that, uh, you know, is that more challenge? I would find that to be a, a greater challenge maybe to try to uh, do. There's a lot of cultural change, I would think, in switching over to context-driven testing when you get into some of those clients. So do you, you see that people are really willing to adopt context-driven testing, or are you doing some some work to need to kind of convince people of how to do it and what the value of that is? Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm not to get in too much of a stump for us, but, you know, we're trying to do things differently at, at Doran Jones. So we, having done a transition at Barclays, I, can, I appreciate the complexities and challenges of trying to retrain testers and the cultural differences that are required kind of on the organizational side for accepting that. Um, and, you know, they're, they're difficult, but I think if you, we, you know, we're quite happy to sit down and talk with people and show them how we test differently, and, sh and, and there's a lot of coaching and mentoring that's required with that. And we really look at our model as kind of, you know, we do delivery, but we also do coaching, mentoring, and apprenticeships. So I think having that investment and having kind of the war stories and scars of how to do that helps a lot. What we found is that some of these consultancies that say their um, context-driven testing is that when the clients are, or prospects are talking to them and they actually do some research on this, they find out very quickly that there's, there's not a lot of people in the market that can help them do those transitions. So I'm never threatened by that because we, we do bake-offs, we'll test alongside people, we'll do whatever you want to demonstrate our value, um, which is very different to the pure pricing model that we compete with some of these folks. Yeah, that's great. Great to hear that, um, you know, you get, uh, we have certainly appreciate what you guys are doing, and it's great to hear that context-driven testing is really taking off in the market because uh, we personally think, you know, it, it brings out a lot more value, you know, in the tester and, and doing more of that testing than, than the checking, and uh, I know we're aligned on that, so uh, it's good to hear. So feel free to keep, keep moving along. Okay. Well, 
we'll crack through here, try and get these last ones done. So to me, um, you know, you see a lot of a talk in the market around crowd testing, um, and, and particularly in the mobile space. I think the market share for crowd testing is going to get uh, uh, deeper, but not wider. And I think my reading of the tea leaves there is that some organizations that would like to use crowd testing are going to find um, some of the, and particularly in enterprise IT, it, it very frustrating. And having dabbled with it a little bit um, in uh, at Barclays um, and other organizations, um, that it's not entirely fit for purpose for a kind of heavy regulated and 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 traditional IT shop in terms of having your own private uh, IT organization. So my uh, my prediction for that is that you're going to see an increase in what I'm calling dedicated crowds. And these are uh, organizations that have pools of resources that they can throw at testing problems and the pricing model will be different um, than what it traditionally has been. So I think you're going to, you're particularly in India, I think you'll, you'll, you'll see that the rise of uh, dedicated crowds because one of the issues with crowdsourced testing is that uh, continuity of resource um, can become an issue. Um, next point, moving in, in, emotional user experience, um, and we found this directly working with startups, is that a lot of the uh, traditional testing approaches of highly scripting do not meet the demands of uh, working and, and particularly with designing user experience. So I've got I've got two predictions here. One of which I uh, I'm, I'm I predict is you'll see hear more about, but I, I don't think it will necessarily work. Which is seeing more automation in the testing of UX design. Um, I've started to see a little uh, little movement there, and I think I think you'll you'll hear more about that. I mean, I also uh, my second prediction in terms of UX is that um, digital media is going to become a very large player for uh, a very large market for testers to get into. I think there's it's it's uh, smallish right now, but I think you're going to see a lot of the growth um, that is going to is predicted in the spend for so the software testing market is going to come from digital media. And my last uh, point here is on regulation. I think traditionally um, people have not been very open about how uh, their security is managed. I think this whole Sony hack thing, although I keep waiting for it. Mm -hmm. um, could potentially have an impact there. Um, I think what you're going to see is, is some big market moving uh, event, I'm going to predict this for next year, is going to have some regulatory effect um, on the way security or at least software testing. I thought Knight Capital would have done that um, when the SEC was actually involved in talking about software testing in their report. Um, we have not seen any change there. I know that they move slowly. Federal regulators move slowly. But I think you're going to see another big event that people are not going to be able to ignore. And, um, and uh, unfortunately, that's going to have a consumer or market impact. And the, the federal government or some regulatory body is going to start talking about software testing in a non-kind of healthcare.gov that was really irritating and kind of a publicly embarrassing way. So that's my prediction for next year. So do we want to move on to uh, questions? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I think that that's great. I really uh, took a lot away from this, and, and I think a lot of our uh, attendees here have definitely been uh, engaged because we've got a lot of questions here, over 50 questions. So uh, one that I've seen a few times here, and so we'll try to get around to as many as we can, is that um, – that people are, are asking about skill-based testing, so they want you to expand a little bit more on what is skill-based testing, you know, just defining that and, and really, uh, I guess, what, what uh, part you see that playing in an overall test strategy. So I think these are some, and there's the, the I'm going to defer that a little bit to the, the stuff that's going to come out and not steal the thunder of the, the Association for Software Testing a little bit, because there is work being done around the AST skills book. There's lots you can read about this, but to me, kind of core skills for a software tester are around um, developing heuristic-based test strategies. And that, again, this is my opinion and what I view as kind of a core skill for a, a the 21st century software tester. 
um, just about testing skills, is being able to use heuristics to quickly generate test strategies um, and, and as well have a, a, a great ability to generate test ideas, um, quickly adapt to new, uh, new environments and contexts, and, and ask good questions. So being able to ask good questions, um, being able to uh, use what, techniques like session-based test management and exploratory testing, being able to visually model um, test ideas, and being able to report in a non-numerical way and to what uh, I think Michael Bolt refers to as test framing um, and, and report in a way that is not, that tells a story to help manage risk. And a lot of what you've seen, you know, and I've seen in terms of test training and how testing gets conducted, it's a very low value proposition approach. So I think those are, if the, I think those maybe five or six things I just mentioned there. Um, and I think there's ways in which you can develop those skills. Uh, again, I'm going to be very biased on that. I think um, uh, rapid software testing and rapid testing intensive um, are, are the two satisfy, test satisfies courses are very good in delivering that. The AST's uh, BBST course, uh, the black box uh, software testing um, foundation course is, is very good as well. Great, great. And, um, you know, along those similar lines uh, as well, people are, are talking about uh, contract context-driven testing uh, and a lot of questions around that and moving towards Agile and wondering if that's really a good starting place if, um, you know, people aren't doing context-driven testing, they're trying to become more Agile. Is context-driven testing, you know, exploratory testing, ad hoc testing, whatever you want to call it, is that a good place to start towards becoming more Agile? Well, I, I, absolutely, and I think this is half the problem with the Agile community is that it's become a, a victim of its own success and has been a bit hijacked by the consultancy business and people trying to, like, I've never seen anything like that since maybe um, DSDM where it kind of got hijacked by the coaching movement and there's lots of people who are, you know, selling their brand of Agile uh, and to coach people into that. So, um, I, 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 again, I'm, I'm a, a big fan and I, I, you know, I align myself towards context-driven testing. I think there's lots of resources available to you to, that will help you become a better tester and a better critical thinker and help you communicate more, which are, to me, hallmarks of what an Agile environment looks like, how to contribute value in that environment. I think there's lots of resources there to start to learn how to adapt to an Agile environment because I guarantee you it, it's as different as any different places that you've worked. You know, everyone kind of defines it their own way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, we had another question uh, in here about uh, whether or not um, you think that uh, you can change culture at an, organiz at an organization that is not currently context-driven, uh, doing context-driven testing. So um, how do you kind of coach people along what are, I guess, a couple key pieces of advice you would have for making that shift? Um, and also how to help folks through their crisis of faith. Um, and this is coming from Damien. Uh, when presented with new info that challenges their deeply held beliefs of, you know, about how they do their job, how do you get people over that hump and get them towards using um, you know, a new method like context-driven testing that may be totally different than what they're doing today? Sure. So you know, I, I very famously said in a talk at Star East a couple years ago, you know, changing culture is hard, but we're going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, I my personal experience in this is that making sure that you when you, when you want somebody to change their behavior or you're trying to introduce something new the amount of background work that's required to introduce a new idea or concept is is usually the part that people spend the least amount of time on they usually focus more on the new idea than trying to understand and why people do the things the way they do already. And I'm not just talking about from a kind of, you know, very, um, you know, explicit uh, procedural way, but really who the person is, why they make those decisions, why they feel that this has worked in the past, 
you know, change is, is scary to folks, and, you know, there's a lot of herd mentality in organizations. So what I try and spend time on when I'm trying to help people change their way of thinking about things is, one, accept that it's going to be really, really hard work and make sure that my mind frame is, you know, one, um, and not to get too philosophical, but one that is kind of cloaked in, in humility and that not coming at people trying to tell them how to do their job because that's almost a guaranteed way of they'll just wait you out until you get tired and then they'll, they'll move on to something else. So making sure that you're trying to understand how what you're going to introduce, and this is the second point, is going to make them successful. Right? I personally believe a lot of the principles around context-driven testing help our organizations achieve more value, one, out of testing, and two, out of our business. And so that helps my developers, BAs, projects, the CIO, and I've talked a lot about this as well, is being able to speak their language and being able to use interactional expertise to help them realize why we should do things differently. And, and that, to me, the prep work around that, you know, it doesn't matter what you're really trying to introduce. But the background work around finding out why people do the things they are, why they do things the way they do, who those people are, what their biases are, is, is, is how you're going to be successful with that. Um, and being able to have real strong goal alignment that if we test differently, I'll get you better information to help you make better decisions, which is in turn going to make you more successful. Um, and coming at that in a really kind of humble way, of our goal here is to make them more successful and the organization more successful. If you're going to come at people with a, a gun to their head, um, they're generally going to have a negative reaction to that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that's very, very valuable insight. And uh, we've had uh, uh, one more question here, and we've got about a minute left. So uh, just your high level one to two pieces of advice um, that you've learned from testing and, and over your career in testing, Keith, that you would want to share with everyone as a takeaway of, of how to succeed uh, as a tester in an organization. I know that may be a tough one to answer in a minute, but if you have anything that comes to mind, <laughs> feel free to share. Yeah, so, I mean, to me, is you know, I'm, I've said this the other day, you know, the only thing I can control is how hard I work. And continually learning and ad adapting my approach and really being a voracious self-educator to me is a hallmark of just a successful person, let alone a successful tester. So there is so much out there in the testing world to learn about and read and get up, on, uh, up to speed on stuff. So really having an open mind and, and being a student of our craft to me is the best piece of advice I could give you. Being a very skilled tester, I think you won't be out of a job and having and, and have more success if you if you if you take that approach of continually learning and looking for new things. The other thing is um, being able to ask questions um, and question everything without um, in, in a in a way that doesn't divide. And that's I think you have to. You know, I, I've not been uh, successful at that <laughs> in my entire career, but as I get older, I think, you know, being able to get information out of people without feeling like they're being interrogated um, has a lot to do with, as, you know, you, you get older, I think you realize that, um, and more experienced, that the more I learn, the less I know, um, and, mm -hmm. and coming at it that way, I think, is, is, is my two pieces of advice. Read everything and question everything. Well, that's great. Yeah, that's a great piece of advice to uh, wrap up on. And I think overall, you know, I've learned a lot. We've got a lot of feedback from people. They think your insight's been great. So we appreciate it. You know, Keith, thanks for all of your time today and uh, joining us. And as we mentioned, this will be the first of many, first annual of many. So we look forward to coming back next year at the end of 2015 and seeing how accurate your predictions were. <laughs> thanks, Kevin. I really appreciate it. I had a good time. and Hopefully people got something out of it. Yes, yeah, I think everyone did, and thank you everyone for joining. I uh, appreciate you taking the time today. We will be posting a recording of this video uh, out on our site, QA Symphony, and we'll be sending a, a link for you as well uh, to that video. So uh, please look out for that. That should be coming out within a day or so. Uh, please feel free to share with other people, and thank you very much for joining us. We'll talk to you next year. All right, thank you. Bye.